Hello, this is Sonia from An Enthusiastic Reader. Thank you for joining me for this recent reads. I have six books that I have finished that I would like to talk about and a few more that I am reading right now. So let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, the first book I'd like to talk about is Independent People by Haldor Laxness. This book was published in 1934 and is this is the story of a struggling sheep farmer and his family, and they live in what is called a croft, which is kind of a home built into the rocks in Iceland. The novel was published in 1934, like I said, and uh, his publication publication history over time through the early part of the 1900s ended up awarding him for the Nobel Prize for Literature. He uses a lot of economics and political rhetoric in the book. For me, that was not the most interesting part of the book itself, but more about the individual struggle for survival and the interpersonal relationships between the characters in the book. Uh, the main character is... Um, Sorry, I'm getting a text. The main character is named Barter, and he had been a serf and was recently freed from his serfdom or his indentured servitude and had earned enough money to, to buy this little tiny piece of land where he could cultivate um, sheep and have a family. And he ends up getting married, but he is not your typical hero. His only goal in life is to be independent from any owing anyone anything. So he wants to be solely independent and to the detriment of everyone around him, he lives by this kind of credo. He is a very selfish and self-centered man. He considers himself a poet and is always creating verses and reciting them to whoever will listen. Um, he's very self-important and does not care about the suffering of anyone. He works, he has a number of children, he works them essentially to death. He's, they have to work 14 and 16 hours a day trying to keep all of his the animals alive. And his first wife dies, his second wife has n a number of children, many of whom don't survive, and she is constantly in bed sick with pregnancy of some kind or another. Um, so that's the setup of the novel. His daughter from his first wife is named Asta, and so she's the eldest and she is a dreamer. She wants to get an education, which is not really possible, but she is allowed to learn to read. And one of the very first books that she is able to possess is Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And this book makes her be um, just like enthralled with romance and being saved and, and being a, a heroine of her own story. And so she lives by this dream of eventually you know, being rescued, in a sense, from her predicament of living in this family. The writing is beautiful. The writing, um, when it's not talking about socialism or the economics of the, co the communal, the community, community markets where they are beholden to it, beholden to each other, uh, all the merchants and all of the providers of different things to try and survive as a community through their e economic system. And there is a lot of corruption and politics and people selling each other out and all of the things that happen that we have seen like play out over time happen in this book. And Barcher just wants to remain independent. Slowly over decades, he loses his ability and his grip on his own economic situation and is forced to choose how he will proceed. But I thought I'd write a little bit, or I thought I would read a little bit of the prose about what happens when the family gets their first cow. And Barcher is not at all happy about this, but the writing and the anticipation of what's going to happen when they get this animal brought to them is just, it's very indicative of what the writing is like. And, um, and so I thought I would give a sample. It was in the snow lit brightness of one tranquil day early in March that there befell great events, never afterwards to be forgotten. Those who have experienced such a thing will know what it means. There was movement in the west on the ridge, extensive, mysterious. The boys who by now had also made the acquaintance of the rhymes 
maintained that it was a troop of berserks on their way to join battle. Here was no small relief in the monotony of mid midwinter when even a man with a stick is a phenomenon. Slowly the troop wound its way down into the valley. Both little Nani and Asta had climbed to the top of the snowdrift at the door. Even Grandma scrabbled her way up the 18 snow steps to the top and shaded her eyes with her hand. It was a cow. Yes, it's a cow all right, cried the boys. Last to join the group was Barter himself, gray with hay mold and foul of temper. There was no room for cattle here. He wasn't going to have the hay taken from his sheep like this and thrown to cattle, nor had he any desire to take the stall away from his horse, to which he owed more than to any animal alive except the bitch, and handed over to a strange cow, whereupon he disappeared and did not show himself again before a formal demand was made for his presence." And on crawled the expedition home across the marshes, the cow followed by its fodder on a horse-drawn sledge. It was a sea cow. Yes, it's a sea cow, all right, cried the boys. She was not very big. Over her back and flanks was bound a cloth from which there stuck a dapple gray head. Wondering and suspicious, and under her udder was tied a woolen rag to prevent her te teats from dra trailing in the snow. The breath hung in steaming clouds about the cow's nostrils in the still frosty air. There was rime on her whiskers. The smoke from the chimney and the smell of home roused her curiosity still further. She sniffed and snorted and tried again and again to fetch a moo as if in greeting, but the halter muzzled her too tightly. The old woman hobbled forward on her stick to meet her. Thrice blessed creature, she mumbled, welcome and a blessing on her. And the cow sniffed at the old woman and, as if she recognized such a woman immediately, tried to repeatedly to moo in greeting to her. Thrice blessed creature, mumbled the old woman again. It was the only remark that occurred to her, she who had, who had never addressed anyone else in so kindly a manner. She stroked the cow's rimy cheek, and the cow rumbled deep down in her throat. They understood each other immediately. So all the connections, many of the connections between the people are with animals, and the siblings themselves are very connected to each other, and but not to their father so that's part of the trajectory of the story it's a very long book there are lots of comic elements to it and a lot of real tragedy it's written in a tone that is very light at the beginning and and almost as a fairy tale in a sense um kind of hearkening back to the mythology of iceland and the gods and goddesses that ruled before christianity came in um and then it gets a little bit darker as the story goes on. And it was a delight. And I, I read this with Teresa, my friend, and we've read many books together. And we both thought this was an incredible book that would deserve a reread at some point. And if you're ever looking for something from Iceland to read, I would highly recommend one of the greatest purportedly one of the greatest works of Icelandic literature. Okay, next I'd like to talk about Gray Bees by Andrei Kirkov. This is translated from the Russian. Um, I'll put the translator here because I, of course, forgot to write it down. But this is a really interesting story about a man who lives in an abandoned village. Um, he's a beekeeper. He worked in the mines before and he was, he was hurt in an accident, so he isn't able to get around as well. And his wife and daughter have left him because he is in what is called the gray zone between Ukraine and Russia. Of course, this took place probably in the, I would say, 2010s somewhere, so before the current invasion. But it's this, he is a really interesting, funny character. He sees the absurdity of life and he keeps these bees. There is one other villager in town who stayed and our main character doesn't really like him very much, but he also relies on him and they become more and more friends as time goes by because they're the only two people for the most part that they can talk to. And a lot of funny things happen in the first half of the book and a, and a few tragic things. And then he realizes he needs to take his bees and leave the area because there's too much shelling, too much shooting, too much uncertainty, and he wants his bees to be able to make honey for the summer. And so he goes on a little road trip um, and you meet all of the people he encounters along the way. 
that are interesting. He has a bit of a romance for a time and meets all these characters who have are trying to survive during this weird time in the the tensions between the countries of Russia and Ukraine. So I won't say more about it than that, but I just thought it was such a very different take on a war novel. It sheds a light on what happens um, when there are border skirmishes. There was there was not an out and out war, but there was a constant kind of cold war and then a hotter war as things go on. So. Uh, but what drives this novel is the character. He is a really interesting character, and it's written in first person, so it's his story and his observations and his hurts and joys along the way. Another book I read for book club that really did not work for me very well is In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. This is a World War I novel about very young men, 17, 16, 17, and 18 years old, um, taking and they are poets and so it's taking a lot of things that really happened in world war one with like siegfried sassoon for example and other poets of the time owen owen i've forgotten his name of course um and kind of based it on that so they're in boarding school one of the characters is jewish and the other is not and they are gay and they are closeted, experimenting with sexuality where where and when they can, and then World War I breaks out, and one of the characters is German, and because they live in England, his family encourages him to join the war effort immediately so that they don't get um, persecuted because of their German heritage. And so he joins up, and then his love... Um, who is Jewish decides also to join. Um, and all of the other characters in this entire novel are essentially blank slates. They are not that interesting. We really don't get to know them well, other than just it felt they almost felt like stock figures that were kind of slated in to bolster the story of the two main characters. And uh, I also felt like a lot of this was repeated information from other novels I had read. I didn't see the originality and I didn't, I just didn't think it was that well done and I didn't think the writing was that good. And I'm wondering if it's because a couple of years ago I read, or I think it was last year, read the Ghost Road Trilogy or the Regeneration Trilogy starting with um, Regeneration by Pat Barker and it covered this information so much better. It was so much more rich psychologically, historically. I didn't feel like it was just taking a bunch of set historical events and cobbling them together for for a story for a younger age. And so maybe that's, you know, that's on me too. I'm an older person and I just felt like this was very watered down even though there was a ton of violence, a ton of war atrocities described and, and, and horrors, but I also felt like the characters maybe weren't as affected as they should been, have been by the horrors of war and were much more worried about their love lives. And um, so it's very complicated, my reaction to it. But I would say if you're interested in World War I literature, please just read the Regeneration Trilogy. That's my own kind of biased take on that. Um, I finished, I just finished a short story collection called Bliss Montage by Ling Ma. She wrote the kind of hit novel from a few years ago called Severance, which was, had nothing to do with the Apple TV series. Instead, it was about a post- pandemic world in which people who had caught a virus were essentially zombies living out, wrote things like looking to put their clothes on in the morning or make breakfast. And they become these kind of not scary zombies, but just these zombie creatures who are until their bodies finally gave out, were just like stuck living the routines of their past and it, so it was a bit of an analogy to what we do even in the face of tragedy is that we just keep doing the same things but anyway it had a really compelling character and she did not have the virus and she was trying to escape and um after she had kept doing her job 
much longer than she needed to. Anyway, all that to say that this author wrote these really interesting short stories. Some of them have kind of uncanny, similar uh, themes to them. For instance, there is one story called G in which there is a drug you can take called G that makes you kind of invisible. So the story is about a friendship that has kind of gone stale and the two women get together to take G together again one last time before the main character is leaving the city to go live somewhere else. And so this is what happens when they take G for the last time. And it was really an interesting story. And there's a fantastic story in there called Peking Duck, which deconstructs, it's, well, it's about a writer and it's about her using a story from her childhood, um, from her mother's point of view and turning it into a, a kind of a famous story. And it's about interrogating whose story was it um, to tell. And I, I can't even describe it other than it was just, it gives you so much to think about. Um, the way that the story is presented in several parts and deconstructed and, and reconstituted. And, and uh, I cannot recommend the collection. I, I loved every story in the collection and some were just ones that I will be thinking about for a really long time. Finally, um, I had an arc of the new Michael Cunningham novel called Day, which is a COVID novel. Um, I wanted to love this book. It's, it's about... It's about five adults and two children. We get all of their perspectives um, and it's set, the, the structure of the novel is that it's April 5th, 2019, April 5th, 2020, and then April 5th, 2021. So you see what happens to all the characters. There's a main character named Robbie. He's kind of a free spirit and he has a sister named Isabel and she loves Robbie. And her husband also loves Robbie. He loves her husband. And then, <laughs> so the women in this novel are really depicted as very cold, depressed, detached, and unhappy. And the men in the story are all kind of free spirit artists, kind of doing what they want. And the children, one of them's five years old and she is like an 80 year old woman in a five year old body, which really didn't feel you know, she's just such a deep soul and she intuits everyone's in intentions and and her brother is older and he is um, very unhappy and very angry and acting out and that um, it is a very dour novel very dour so I would say um, I can't recommend it. I didn't love it. Um, some of the writing was lovely, but it was also overwritten in many ways, I thought. And yeah, I just, between that and the Lori Moore COVID novel, or well, that was not a COVID novel, but a Lori Moore pre-COVID novel, um, I just didn't like their takes on modern culture. So if you've are planning to read this or once you do read it, please come find me and tell me what you thought. I'm interested to know if anyone else will read it and maybe I read it wrong and maybe there, there will be other interpretations, but it, it just did not work for me. All right, I'm gonna pause this because I'm gonna go look at the eclipse. Okay, I'm back. The eclipse is about three quarter, or a, I'd say about a third done. All right, All right, that's everything I've read. So six books, that's pretty good, right? And I am reading four books right now, which is a lot of books to be reading at the same time. But let me tell you quickly about them. I'm doing a buddy read with Sean, The Book Maniac, The Go-Between by L.P. Hartley. This is a kind of a coming of age story about a young boy who is like a fish out of water living or living in the summer for um, two weeks. <sighs> Sorry, I'm out of breath. His father has died. And so anyway, he goes to live with his rich friend for two weeks and it's all the things that happened to him during this tumultuous two weeks. And the writing is so good. The way it's framed, it's him looking back on the past as he's in his fifties or something and kind of looking back at that summer and looking at the diaries he wrote during this time and 
and it's just like revealing this incredible like spirit of this boy and you can see that he from the beginning that he didn't turn out to be as exuberant as he was when he was a boy and anyway um, I'm just really enjoying that so we're, we are reading that pretty slowly and just savoring the writing okay another book I just started and I was gonna save this for November for nonfiction November but I really wanted to get into it because I saw somebody excerpt some of it on blue sky which is the new Twitter so I do have a couple of invite codes so anybody who ever wants to go on blue sky I would say the whole environment of blue sky right now is much more like early Twitter um, and a lot of news organizations are starting to move over there too. So it feels like Twitter before it got really crazy and gross. So if you would, you know, first come first serve to anybody who wants um, an invite code. Um, I just don't want to publish it because there are a lot of bots that are going out and scooping them up. So you can just contact me um, and we'll, we can exchange the code anyway. Uh, it's awesome. Sarah from Hardcover Hearts is there. Kazan from Always Doing is there. Sean the Book Maniac is, Book Maniac is there. So there's some booktubers and um, I don't know. Anyway. If Hi, this is editing Sonia. Um, I'm, so I'm editing the video and I realize I never talk about the book that I wanted to talk about. It's called Doppelganger by Naomi Klein. And what it is, the premise of it is she's investigating what it's like to be mistaken for a woman named Naomi Wolf, who is a conspiracy theorist and um, a bad actor in terms of trying to talk about what's happening in the world and trying to debunk big conspiracy theories and anti-vax stuff. And so Naomi Klein is often mistaken for Na Naomi Wolf, and they both write about popular culture and about um, media criticism and a lot of things they write about the same, but they have completely different worldviews. And so the book is a bit of a memoir about what it's like to investigate someone who everyone thinks is you. So um, I just forgot to talk about it. All right, I'm reading Mr. I'm reading Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens. Uh, Kelly from Books I'm Not Reading raved about this book. I think was last year or the year before she read it. And I've always been intrigued by it. And I just, she really inspired me. And so I have started it and I love it so far. It's, I've only read three chapters, but the characters are really coming to life already in the conflicts and, and Mr. Dombey is a horrible man so far. And he has a newborn son and he's hired a wet nurse named Polly Tootles and he doesn't really want to remember her name, so he just says, oh, I'll just call you Richards. And so he will only call this woman Richards, and she, he won't let her see her own five children during the time when she is taking care of this baby. And there's other outrages, and I can tell it's going to be an excellent book. And finally, my last book club book for the year is The Logger Queen of Minnesota by J. Straddle Ryan. And I had read Kitchens of the Great Midwest a few years ago, and I thought it was delightful. It was a really charming novel about a bunch of different characters, and it relates around food. And this one so far is about a woman who is in her, let's say, early 60s. Her husband is has just been disabled because he is unable to drive his truck anymore and they're relying on her salary as a uh, dietary aid in a nursing home and so they're really struggling financially she makes pies and her, apparently her family had a farm and her sister inherited the whole farm so she's estranged from her sister she's struggling financially and she can make good pies and that's all i know about it so far but loving the writing it's very unsentimental um, the character is i mean, almost cold but she's just very stiff upper lip and very midwestern stoic um, and i'm really enjoying this so far so Oh my gosh, that's all I have to say about what I'm reading right now. And the the plans I have for the rest of the year, for sure I, I know I want to read The Fraud by Zadie Smith and I want to read 
The North Woods by David Mason because it was highly reviewed by Ron Charles. It got five stars in the Washington Post. And then I also saw Rick McDonnell had read it and he said, you must read this novel. So that is definitely on my list. And I've got the audiobook for The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by um, James McBride, and it just won the Kirkus Prize. And Angelia from Read and Reread. I hope I got that name right off the top of my head, but she just finished it and she loved it. So, and the, finally, I'd, I would like to get to a new name by Jan Fossa. That is, he is the Norwegian who just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. It's the third in a, I'm calling it a third in a trilogy, although there's two books in each volume, so it's six books. But anyway, it, basically one long story. So if you ever want to read it, I suggest just getting all of them and just reading it like one big novel, which I wish I would have done. But I've read the first two volumes and I would like to finish that out and just see how it resolves. Um, the writing is like hypnotic and mesmerizing and weird. And you get into the groove of this man's narrative. And also he has a doppelganger. So I'm reading about doppelgangers and then... Oh, I didn't, I don't think I said that that's what I wanted to read. Never, I'll talk about it in the next video. Okay, you guys, I'm losing my mind. All right, I think that's all I have to say for now. Um, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say in the comments. Please let me know. And yeah, have a great week. The, um, the world, I am deeply sad by the entire Middle East situation, um, terrified for all the people involved on both sides. I'm just very, it's very scary for the civilians who really have no power and they, these big governments or these terrorist organizations have no regard for the actual just people of the area. So anyway, I have no profound things to say about it other than I'm so sad about the whole thing. So on that happy note, um, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you so much for watching and for subscribing or for leaving a comment or just for being here and bye. Goodbye. <laughs>